my name is Helen Zhang, and I am the professional developer at the Lamoson MIT program. Thanks a lot for your interest in the webinar this evening. Today we will talk about batteries. So welcome you all. As a lot of you are aware of, starting last October, we have been offering a series of webinars once every two weeks. The topics are organized around mind-on and hands-on skills that are essential to invention. This week, we will talk about one of the hands-on skills about working with batteries. In total, we are going to conduct two webinars related to batteries, circuits, and also electronics. This one specifically will focus on a brief overview of batteries and tools. In four weeks, we'll talk about the second uh, hands on the second re second webinar about battery circuit and electronic scan, which is more focused on troubleshooting circuits and electronics. All of our previous webinars have been recorded. You can find the recorded webinars and slides on our website so that if you go to the lemosin.mit.edu website and go to the resources tab, you will find them all under the invention resources. After this webinar, we will send out a separate email about how to access this recording and also register to our next webinar, which will, come, will happen in two weeks. The next webinar will be about a mind-on mind scale, which is about how to involve your community during invention projects. Please keep an eye on that. For today's webinar, we have set up the chat window so that you can post your questions. And at the end of our presentation, we'll have about five minutes to answer the questions. And also, if this webinar runs a little bit late, Don and I will stay afterwards so that we can answer the questions. You don't need to turn on the microphone on your computer during the webinar. OK, let's get started. First, just to briefly introduce our program. The Lemosin MIT program is a multi faceted program for inventors at all ages. We have the invention education program. Specifically, we have over 15 years of experience working with high school students and middle school students and also teachers. Specifically, we have two grants initiatives, the Invent Teams grant initiative, which focus on high school students, and the JV Invent Teams Grants Initiative, which also focus on middle school students and teachers. Over the past 15 years, seven of our high school invent teams have received the US patents, and a few of them are now in the process of, of applying for their patents. And a lot, lots, lots of our students have presented at national or state levels of science, engineering, and design conferences. For today's webinar, I'm very happy to invite Don Domes, one of our, our master teachers, to co-host this webinar. And Don will share his experience of working with batteries. A brief introduction of Don. Don is a retired high school CTE teacher working for the Hillsboro Public School District in Oregon. Since his retirement, he has been working on special projects in STEAM and CTE for the Office of School Performance in the school district. He has been hosting workshops and webinars to present practical suggestions and tips to teachers who teach engineering, teach robotics, teach science, and all this kind of project-based uh, project learning. About 10 years ago, Don led the Hillsboro High School event team. Since then, he has been working with us as a master teacher. So Don, welcome. Can you tell us more about the invention your team pre created? Yes, as you look at the picture there, you can see there's a young lady uh, sitting at essentially a, con a it was a gaming console. And in front of her is a special material on what would be the windshield of the car. And what the kids wanted to do was for safety to help people to be able to look through the windshield and not have to look down at the dashboard or look down for driving directions and those kinds of things. So what they decided to do, and this was back in 07, 
what they wanted to do was essentially create a computer that was placed underneath the passenger seat. It tied into the onboard diagnostics connector in the car, which let them connect to the computer in the car. And then they could also connect to things like Microsoft Streets and Trips and other kinds of things. And then all of that would be displayed in the bottom quarter of the windshield. This is very similar to heads-up display systems in commercial aircraft and military aircraft. And they actually successfully got this to work. Uh, regretfully, during the time we were doing it, Microsoft filed a whole ton of patents. <laughs> but uh, it was a great, fun project. And we actually had it working in a minivan that belonged to one of the kids. And then we set it up with this gaming console for your Eureka Fest. Oh. This is a great down. Um, thanks a lot for sharing this amazing invention. Unfortunately, Microsoft is filing all the patents. <laughs> yeah. I bet your t inventing work at that time, even 10 years ago, they worked with devices that used the batteries. Yes. Yeah, so as you were saying, yeah, nowadays in our modern lives, it seems everything is kind of all related to some sorts of electricity or batteries. So it's almost hard for me to imagine our life without the battery or without the electricity. First, before we start talking more deeply about tools working with batteries, I think we will first do an overview of what is in a battery and how a battery works. So first, the picture on this slide, on the right side, you can see it's a typical dry cell battery or the typical disposal battery common we can use we, we commonly use in our everyday life this kind of battery includes three parts first is the cathode which is the positive terminal it's here and there's also this anode which is a negative terminal and also there's this electrolyte that's kind of in the center of in the middle of the battery so the cathode is connected to the electrolyte paste inside the battery through this carbon rod. The carbon rod is at the center of the battery. And the anode is connected to the zinc alloy outer can. You can see this yellowish, very thin outer. This is actually zinc alloy and is connected to the negative end of the battery. In this example, this is a zinc carbon battery that is kind of very commonly used in everyday life. In this kind of a battery, the chemical reaction happens between the zinc alloy and the electrolyte. So when it happened, what happened is the electrons are built up around the anode at this side. And in order for them to complete the, the reaction, the electrons need to travel all the way to the ions in the electrolyte to complete the reaction. But unfortunately, they cannot do this inside the battery. That's because inside here, you can see there's this cardboard separator that try to separate the cathode and the anode apart. The electrons cannot just fly directly from the uh, cathode to the anode. Yeah, we cannot fly from, sorry, it's actually from the anode to the cathode. So it has to fly through, travel through certain conductors, such as the conductive wires, where we can put them together. So here you see what we call a closed circuit, because there's a pathway from the anode to the cathode. And that pathway goes from the negative end there, as you see in the arrow. It goes through the connecting wires, and then it comes around and you, we have to have a load, and in this case, the load is a light bulb. And basically, the battery is a little package of chemistry, and the electrons, the negative charges collect on that negative end, and they really want to equalize with the lack of electrons or the positive side of the battery. And the wire actually is the catalyst that starts the chemical reaction. And then, of course, in any kind of basic circuit you need a supply which a battery is a great thing to use you need connecting wires and then you need a load that does something like a lamp or a motor or a led etc and that limits the current flow if there if you just connected a wire from one end of a battery to the other end 
and it's a small little battery like a D or a C, it'll actually get warm because you, the chemical reaction, as the chemical reaction goes on, it heats up. Uh, it's not a good thing to do to just connect a, a wire from one end to the other of the battery if it's a large battery. Like an automotive battery, it'll actually make the wire glow red, melt the insulation off, people can get burned, um, because you need a load that limits the current flow. So this is the, the direction generally is from negative to positive. Um, there are some books that present it positive to negative. The issue is, the, the key thing is that the current, has, the current can flow and the chemical reaction can occur. Great. So batteries come in different types and sizes. For example, you know, in the example uh, we were just uh, talking about, uh, in the example Don was just uh, talking about the chemical reactions, some of the chemical reactions can be reversible, some of the chemical reactions are not that easily reversible. In the picture on the upper right hand here, these are all the common disposable or non-rechargeable batteries we use in our everyday life. In, for this kind of batteries, what happens is the chemical reactions are not easily reversible. This means once the chemical reaction is, is over, the active materials don't easily go back to their original form. So that's why once the, the battery is used up, then you can just dispose this. And for the second type of battery, which is often called the rechargeable batteries, you can see here, for example, these are the examples of the batteries, and this is the car battery, and this is a lithium ion battery that we often use in iPhones, iPads, or other kind of small devices. For this kind of uh, batteries, the chemical reaction inside them can be relatively easily reversed once you charge them. So the active materials, they can go back to their original forms. For Especially the car batteries and all the lithium batteries are most commonly used rechargeable batteries that we use for now. And so there's different sizes of batteries. Of course, the car battery that you can see there on the left is a 12.6 volt battery. Then you have a 4.5. And then you have your common D, C, AA, and AAA cells. Now, a battery is actually a combination of cells. Certain chemicals, when you put them together, like the alkaline or the uh, carbon zinc, like the D cell that you see right there, that battery is not rechargeable. And the chemistry, when you put specific chemicals together it w in the right ways, they will create a certain amount of voltage difference. The D cell that's alkaline or carbon zinc will be 1.5 volts. If it's NiCAD, it'll probably be 1.35 volts. If you go over back over to the left on the car battery, the car battery is a wet cell, and you'll notice there's a yellow or a orange and a blue cap. Those are the positive and negative terminals. Behind that, she's Helen's pointing now to those little uh, caps right there, and those caps can be opened up to check the fluid level inside the battery. Now, it's acid that's inside the battery. In that case, the acid plus the specific materials in the battery, each cell will be 2.1 volts. And we can count there that there's six of them. They're in series. So that's how the car battery actually makes a 12.6 volt battery. The 9 volt battery over on the uh, over on the right hand side, it actually has six little one and a half volt cells in it. Now, depending upon the usage of the battery, you're going to get a certain amount of voltage out of the battery in terms of the difference in pressure, and then generally the size of the battery has to do with how long it will support a chemical reaction that will produce current. And if you think back in the days uh, 10, 15 years ago when we had flashlights that had, instead of LED bulb in the flashlight, they just had a little uh, filament bulb, we would oftentimes put D cells in those flashlights because the D cells are larger 
and then ideally the flashlight would last longer because we had a bigger package of chemistry. The C cell is a little bit smaller. Sometimes you get into issues of wanting the device to be smaller. So then you, and from a design standpoint, you have to decide, well, what size battery are we going to use? There's all different sizes of batteries, and basically the size of the battery usually has to do with the amount of chemistry, the materials that are in there, although uh, you can, th there's, based on the chemistry, you can get quite a bit of voltage and current out of some chemistry, that, but then it might cost you a lot. So it's, it's not like, well, we could just, you know, make a battery that would run a car and make it small because cost of chemistry and design, and there's a lot of factors that go into battery design. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so next, before we start talking about the tools specifically working with batteries and circuits, I want to emphasize the basic safety rules when we work with batteries. So battery, when you work with batteries or small electronics, it's the same as when you work with tools. Make sure that your students are aware of all these safety rules. For example, make sure that if students have any doubt about how to use the tool, or some students have, I have previously have met students who are just very afraid of batteries and electricity in general, make sure they will ask you about that and make sure that we will try to clear their doubts before they start working with those tools. And also, no matter whether students have to create a closed circuit or working with a device, make sure they have some plans before they are going to work on this. And also, an important one is because they are going to, we need to work with batteries and electronics, make sure that students' workplace are kind of relatively dry so that they don't have water or any kind of conductive solutions that might create a shot in the circuit. Okay. So Don, can you talk about tools working with batteries? Right, and I, and I want to mention also, if you're working with a cell, a one and a half volt cell, most of the typical one and a half volt cells that you would find at a variety store or a hardware so store are relatively safe to work with. But when you get into where you've combined cells together, like the automotive battery, that can become uh, very dangerous in some situations because your voltages and currents uh, available can become much higher. And then to test batteries, if you look on the right-hand side where it says amp probe, the little meter with the uh, AA cell sitting there, that's actually, you can buy that on Amazon. It's relatively cheap. And that is my favorite little simple battery tester. And depending upon the size of the battery, then it sets up as you move the red lever there for the different sizes of the batteries, it sets up a different amount of resistance or load that's placed on the battery and displays on the meter uh, how good the battery uh, still is. And so I highly recommend if you're going to work with batteries with kids getting one of those little battery testers. If you have a multimeter, which is pictured on the on the left, that device is really handy. Uh, those cost about probably 20 bucks at uh, Home Depot or Lowe's for a pretty simple one. Uh, I used to buy ones like that in lots of 50 for about eight to ten dollars for my electronics students. The meter, when we call it a multimeter, it's because we can test a, quite a variety of things. Typically, you're going to test voltage or at various levels, you're going to test current at various levels, and you're going to, or you're going to test resistance at various levels. And the multimeter, if connected properly, can test all of those things. Now, in the case that you see, they've got the multimeter hooked up to some kind of a battery, and um, just hooking up a multimeter like that to a battery will not if the battery is terrible, it won't give you much of a reading, but it, the battery, the meter is not supposed to put hardly any load on the circuit, so it doesn't change how the circuit works. So just testing a battery with a multimeter like that won't necessarily tell you if the battery is good or bad. You'll notice there's a Vimeo uh, link there. If you go to vimeo.com forward slash domes, D-O-M-E-S, 
there's a lot of videos from when I taught electricity and electronics on that site. And there's videos that explain how to use the multimeters. Yeah. Thanks a lot for talking, for introducing all these tools. Especially when you are working with batteries, make sure you will check how much electricity or how much energy is still left in the battery because before you're working with the batteries. So it's important you test them before you use it. And also when you are, if specifically if you are working with car batteries, sometimes you need something that is power enough, please make sure that you don't tilt that car batteries. What happens because inside the car batteries, there is this lead acid, which is a ve relatively very strong acid. So if you tilt it, there might be chances that such a strong acid will be leaked out. So make sure you don't tilt it and make sure your student don't tilt it. And also, if you happen to work with students at a very young age, for example, elementary students and especially the K-3 grades, make sure that do not allow them to work with coin cells. The thing is that coin cells, they might swallow them and it's going to be very dangerous. And once coin cells get into your stomach, it literally will start leakage in two hours, which is very dangerous. Next, I would like to talk about a fun activity we often ask, re recommend middle school students and high school students to do so that they can form a better understanding about the batteries. So this activity will require students to work with five to 10 pennies and using five to 10 pennies, they can create a battery that can provide enough power to light up a red LED light. The, pen, the materials for the pennies you're going to use, make sure that you will have those pennies that are made after 1982. What happened is before 1982, most of the, pen, the pennies are made of copper. And after 1982, because of high cost of copper, those pennies, the only the after side of the after layer of the pennies are made of copper. Inside is actually zinc. So it's very important those pennies have a zinc interior and you will need some kind of sandpaper and also paper tower. Make sure you cut four square cutouts of the paper towers. Those paper towers need the size of the paper tower need to be slightly smaller than the size of the penny. And you will also need vinegar and salt and also a cup of water. And of course, the red LED light and some kind of tape. So when you work on this activity, the first step is you use the sandpaper to sand one side of the four pennies until the outer layer, the copper part is removed. Make sure you only work on one side of those pennies. And on the picture on the right side, you can see the upper hand is an example of a finished sanded penny. And make sure you leave the fifth penny intact. You don't need to sand all the pennies. And as a next step, you need to make a saturated salt, so, salt solution. You just add salt to the water. And this battery will work great if the solution is a little bit acidic. So when you make the salt solution, just add a few drops of vinegar in there and dip the paper tower squares in the solution. So as a next step, what you need to do is to place the soaked square on top of the zinc side of the penny and then stack the other four pennies and squares using the same patterns. As a final step, you place this longer wire of the LED against the surface of the top penny and the other wire against the bottom. And then you will see this red LED light is on. What happened with this battery, why it works is because one side of the sanded cell is a negative electrode and the other side is a positive electrode. And all these pennies are connected to one another by a conductive solutions, like with this uh, vinegar and salt solutions. There are a lot of uh, ions in the solution. So this activity, it's going to be very fun and students really enjoy it, especially you can imagine their excitement when they see the LED light is on. So there are a few tips when you use this. First, be prepared. The sending might take some time, especially if you are working with young kids. 
And when you have students send the painting, make sure they start the Lincoln Memorial site, which is relatively easier to send. And also make sure they will send away all the copper layers, the after layers. And the second tip is the paper tower, the size of the paper tower squares need to be smaller than the penny because if the paper towers that between the pennies, they touch each other, that's going to create a shot in the circuit. And also those paper towers need to be wet, but they cannot be so soaked so that the water will kind of flow around and create a lot of shot. And the final tip is, you know, the LED lights, they only work, the LED lights only work in one direction. So if the LED light is not, not on, just switch the direction of the legs and you might see that the LED light will on. So we want to make sure that you recycle batteries when the batteries no longer work for you. Best way to know if they're working is to use that little uh, tester that was in a previous slide. The alkaline batteries, those can be, um, there's a mechanical process to recycle those and get the chemicals back out of them. The lead acid batteries, like your automotive batteries, et cetera, there's actually quite a bit of chemistry inside of those. Many of you have noticed that if you go to buy a car battery, if you don't trade in a car battery at the same time, they make you pay a what they call a core charge because there's, they, they want those batteries, and in fact, if you have lead-acid batteries, you can actually take them down to a lot of battery places and sell them. Um, the, uh, doing the recycling, if you can find, um, sometimes Home Depot or Lowe's, especially if you've got tool batteries, uh, portable tool batteries, they will recycle those. Sometimes they'll recycle some of the others also. I recommend that for your, all your little batteries that you get Ziploc bags and just go ahead and put the batteries in the Ziploc bags because sometimes they will leak uh, after they've been used. And so that kind of contains everything and you get a few Ziploc bags of them and you find a recycling place and recycle them, protect the environment and help us uh, reuse those chemicals. Yeah, so this finally, we just want to mention about the future of the battery industry in general. So the research on future batteries focus on three main directions based on our needs. First of all, as people are trying to increase the current capacity of the batteries, that is, they are exploring new materials, new chemical reactions with the goal of trying to store more chargers in the same physical size. The second direction is they try to improve the life of a battery because the current rechargeable batteries they can only be recharged for so many times for example you might find the your three-year-old iphones or ipads the batteries wouldn't work as that as well as when you had them so that's the problem of all the rechargeable batteries especially for the lithium-ion battery that is widely used in these devices the third one the most important one is they are trying to make the battery safer you guys probably have heard about the explosions of the battery inside Samsung Note 7. That's why this type, these cell phones get recalled in the United States. So the problem for this kind of batteries, this is also a lithium ion battery. They have inside the batteries, the electrolyte is stored in liquid form. So in, at the liquid state, this electrolyte is highly, highly flammable. That's why now many people, many researchers and scientists are trying to produce or invent solid state batteries because when they store the electrolyte in a solid state, they are relatively stable. So that hopefully there will be less incidents like the explosion of the batteries. So next, these are just some resources on our website. Specifically, if you look into the JV Invent Team curriculum materials called the electric, uh, electronic textile, you will find the detailed instructions about making the five cent battery, penny batteries. And also these are some other resources. For example, the Spark Phone has a great tutorial about how to use multimeter. And there are some other resources more about making penny batteries and also 
how the battery works. And also make sure you check Don's video on the Vimeo channel about the batteries and circuits. So we are at 7 o'clock. So if there are any questions, please post on this. And Don and I will be able to stay 